Those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Pray that it may not happen in winter. I need to begin by thanking Father Chris, who's in charge of our preaching rota, for assigning me these joyful lessons that we have today. One exegetical commentator referred to this gospel as, quote, an exegetical minefield. And so you can imagine people are all over the map on what Jesus is talking about, and in particular, how to apply it. One approach is Jesus is speaking, uh, really warning about the upcoming destruction of the temple by the Romans, which will happen around 70 AD, roughly 40 years after Jesus gives this prophecy. And that's all this passage is about. Other commentators say no, that this is really an end times prophecy, and the he that's mentioned in the text is the Antichrist, and so we need to be on the lookout for the Antichrist and better know the signs of the times. I'm going to take a good Anglican via media approach and say that they're both at least in part right. Jesus draws the imagery from the book of Daniel, warning about a desolating sacrilege. He's alluding back to about 168 BC when the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes went into the Holy of Holies, put up a statue of Zeus, and sacrificed a pig on the altar. You can imagine what that did. That, that resulted in the Maccabean Revolution. One stone was not left on another when Jesus talks about his hearers of the current temple, the second temple. He's referring to the time when the Romans will come and, as he said, not leave one stone on another. In fact, one historian, Eusebius, said the Roman soldiers even dug up the foundations of the temple so that it couldn't be rebuilt. He's getting them ready. This is going to be a more tra- traumatic event than we could probably appreciate. Because for the Jew, a second temple Jew, that temple was the literal presence of God on this earth. And because they did not have eyes to see that Jesus is the living presence of God on this earth, the destruction of the temple rocked their world and completely shook their understanding of God. But I think Jesus is referring to more than just this destruction of the temple by the Romans. Because the verses that follow, we don't see them here today, but the verses that immediately follow, he speaks of the Son of Man coming with great power and sending out the angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. Clearly a reference to the last day. And warning that during the last day, it's going to be as equally difficult for us as it was for them with the destruction of the second temple and as it was for what Antiochus Epiphany did in 168 B.C. What he's basically saying here is the kingdom of God is going to be met with great opposition. It's coming, but it is not going to be a cakewalk. It's going to come with great opposition, great challenges. Many will be tempted to fall away from the faith, and sadly, many will. I think it's very important to understand why Jesus is giving us this warning. Why he's pointing to the destruction of the temple to prepare them, and why he's pointing to the end of the days to prepare us. Why does he do this? It is not, not, not to make us end times experts, to decode the symbols and numbers of weeks and the week and the one and a half week and the one and a half and blessed is he who 136 days and all that stuff that's in Daniel and then all the symbols in Revelation just so we can figure out who finally figure out who the Antichrist is. That's not the point of this warning. Doesn't keep us from trying though, does it? Boy, there's been book after book after book written about this stuff. You may not know it, but the Seventh-day Adventist religion was started on this premise. A lady who is self-proclaimed prophet has predicted when Jesus would return. And she gathered a lot of people and duped a lot of people into following her. And when he didn't return on the day that she said he was going to return, she surmised that he had spiritually returned. Now we're just waiting for him to physically return. And that's how she got around that one. And people are still following It's incredible. But they're not alone. If we're honest with ourselves, there's something in us that really likes the titillation of, if I could just figure out when the last day is going to be, if I could just know who the Antichrist is. There's something really titillating about that. When I was in college, I uh, put flyers up around the dorm that I was going to teach a course on the Revelation to John. We packed the room. But the week before we packed the room, I was studying Revelation and realized I didn't have a clue what any of that meant 
And so I announced, we're going to read the book of Mark. They all bailed on me. Nobody wanted to hear anything about Mark. They wanted to find out what was going on in the book of Revelation. Jesus made it very clear that even he does not know the day or the hour of his return. And so that should put to bed all of our speculations. They're just irrelevant. But we also need to understand that Jesus didn't give us these warnings so that we could live in a state of fear. The scripture specifically says he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But as you know, too much of Christianity preaches fear and lives in fear. The TV preachers with all their charts and the corny Christian movies about the end times and endless speculation about who the identity of the Antichrist is, all of these fan those flames. But sadly, in the end, it plays right into the hand of the enemy because you will find it difficult, if not impossible, if you're walking in fear, to also walk in love as God commands us. So why? Why does Jesus give us these scary scenes? What was his motive? Why is he warning us about the desolation of the sacrilege, which I would submit to you was the temple in his day and the church in our day? He tells us, but take heed, I told you all these things before. Another translation says, stay alert, I've already warned you. He's giving us a heads up so we won't be taken aback when the world goes sideways and we won't quit when the going gets tough. One commentator put it this way. Christians need to be forewarned so that they are forearmed. They will face adversity, hurrying persecutions, false alarms, and the ruin of nations, even their own. He warns us so that we prepare, so that we will endure, as the book of Hebrews just told us. It's in giving us these warnings that Jesus is actually being a merciful and loving head of the church. So if it's true that he's given us a heads up to prepare and to endure, then we need to ask, how is it that we get prepared? If you listen to the world, they'll tell you it's by storing up large quantities of gold and silver and canned food and probably some ammunition because you're going to need to shoot the zombies on, on top of it all. But, but if you look around the persecution of the world today in Nigeria, Pakistan, all that the churches are going through, the answer is hardly gold, silver, and Kansas spam. That's not what they need. In fact, their preparation came from more intimately knowing the one for whom they are willing to suffer. I don't know if you've had the blessing of meeting some of these people. I have. Their faith is courageous. Their faith is infectious. Because they know in whom they have believed and are willing to die for him. So following their example, we prepare for whatever lies ahead by having a much clearer picture of who it is we serve and what our role is in serving him. Let me point you to, I think, what looks like a kind of obscure passage in this text, which really kind of opens the door for this conversation. Listen to what it says. Pray that it may not happen in winter. He gives us all these warnings that seem to be written in stone, and then he says, pray that it may not happen in winter. I looked up a bunch of commentaries, nobody wants to touch that one. But it's fascinated me for years. And I realized something. In its immediate context, it was good for them to pray because Jesus told them to flee to the mountains. And if it happened during winter in Israel, that's when they experienced the flash floods. So it would be impossible to flee to the mountains if they were experiencing flash floods. But in the larger context, I think we can discern a wonderful invitation here to become a part of what God is doing. Pray that it may not happen in winter. I would argue that Jesus would not call us to pray such a prayer if it didn't have the potential at least of being answered. To do so would mean that he's either toying with us or deceiving us and that can never be. So if we pray that it does not happen in winter, then there must be at least the possibility that God will answer that prayer and it will not happen in winter. He calls on us to pray, even though all these things are predicted, that the circumstances might be altered. Isn't that fascinating? It reflects this wonderful mystery of the sovereignty of God and yet man's responsibility. Jesus tells us what the future holds, and then he invites us to be a part of that process, to pray that it won't happen in winter. 
We're not automatons. We're not subjects of fate or karma. We're invited to play a role in what God is doing. We may never fully understand, I don't think we ever will fully understand, the relationship between God being sovereign and us being responsible. But there are two sides of the same coin that if you believe, will put you on very solid ground, deepen your trust in the Lord, and prepare you to face whatever needs to come again. You can see God's sovereignty and your responsibility in your own life if you look back at your own life through the eyes of faith. On one hand, you know very well that you've made some choices that have significantly impacted your life. Some of your choices were good, some of them were bad, but those choices made you who you are today. Yes? Yes. On the other side, if you can see through the eyes of faith the grace of God, you realize He sometimes worked with those choices and He sometimes worked in spite of your choices to get you where he wanted you to be and that's why you're here today. So I love that our choices are real, not some product of fate, but I also love that unless I'm in total rebellion against God, I'm not powerful enough to derail his plans. I've said it many times. If you had told me when I was in my 20s, pastoring a non-denominational church in Florida, that one day I'd be an Anglican priest in Tennessee, I would have laughed you completely out of the building. There's a wonderful expression. You want to make God laugh? Tell Him your plans. He loves that kind of stuff. He invites you to be an active part. He invites you to pray that it may not happen in winter. In other words, take your part. Get in the game. You're welcome. One of my professors at seminary used to put it this way. You're on a plane from Atlanta to London. And while you're on the plane, you can make choices that significantly impact that trip, right? You can choose to eat or not eat. You can watch the movie or you can sleep. You can meet a person on the plane who may become a very important part of your life. You can act out in such a way on the plane that gets you arrested as soon as the plane lands. You can even, for a very short distance, walk in the opposite direction where the plane's going, but the plane is going to London. The kingdom is going to come. And he invites us to be a part of this wonderful, victorious plan. Now, like we've seen in the life of Jonah, we can do it the easy way, or he can make a fish, a worm, and a plant if we choose to do it the hard way. But the plane is going to London. His kingdom is going to come. One of the ways I think that we prepare so that we endure is to be established in convictions that are rooted in Scripture. Established in convictions that are rooted in Scripture. If you're following Jesus because He makes you feel good, what happens when you no longer feel good? But if you're following Him because He is the way, the truth, and the life, then how you feel on any given day is completely irrelevant. It's so wonderful that the colic today could not be more appropriate to call on us to hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Holy Scriptures. That's how we embrace and hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. It is this discipline that creates learned convictions rather than emotion-based beliefs. There was a survey done by Ligonier Ministries out of Orlando, Florida on the state of theology among evangelical Christians. Now, evangelical Christians are Christians who believe in the centrality of the gospel, the authority of scripture, and salvation by grace through faith. These are Bible believers, okay? The survey was very unsettling. 52% said everyone sins a little, but basically everybody's good. 52%. That's not what the Bible teaches. If we are good by nature, then why have all sinned and more than just a little? If we were good by nature, why would we need a Savior? If we were good by nature, why would we need to be born again? 51% said that God accepts the worship of all religions. Again, if all roads are acceptable, then what was the point of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? There is some good news in the survey. 91% said that God counts a person righteous only because of one faith in Jesus. But here's the bad news. 78% said that Jesus Christ was the first and greatest being that God ever created. 78%. Not that He's 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, but that he's the first and greatest creator, creation of God? Actually, that's what the Mormons believe. But that is not what the Church Catholic teaches. These results then are a great argument of why we also need not only to inwardly digest Holy Scripture, but our worship must be Scripture informed, where the true Christ is proclaimed by the creeds, where our fallen condition is addressed in the confession, and where we join ourselves to Christ through the sacraments as our only mediator and advocate. You know, Jesus is not the only one who tells us that these last days will be difficult. Listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Paul has clearly spent too much time on Facebook, right? <laughs> and his point is, we should not be surprised by the condition of the world around us. Again, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. We need to prepare. We need to have a goal to endure to the end because what's coming in the end is greater than we can think or imagine. Jesus' prophecy for the destruction of the temple was fulfilled, so we don't need to flee to the mountains. But in the meantime, we need to accept his invitation to be a part of his plan and continue to pray that it may not happen in winter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.